We have Jerry Jacobs listed as uh, special music today, but I don't believe she's here at this hour. Don't see her. Any else? Anyone else want to sing? <laughs> well, could happen. When you uh, go out in the world today and back about your business, if anyone asks what you did today, you tell them you were in church. And they ask, how was it? You say, our preacher is really hot. <laughs> As were the rest of us. I hope the heat will not bother you too much. I, I complain when it's cold. I complain when it's warm. I complain when it's dry. I complain when it's wet. God forgive us. May we just enjoy the many blessings that God showers upon us and trust that in God's way it is all according to his purpose. The text today is found in Luke's gospel, and I must tell you it's, uh, it was difficult for me. I, I try to stick with the gospel. I don't know if you've caught on to that. Each week in the lection there are four scriptures, and the scripture that is elsewhere in the lection today from the books of Kings tells the story that I love to talk about, and maybe one of these years we'll spend a summer like no other in the Old Testament. Because there are great stories of faith in the Old Testament, and one that is there today is the healing of the Syrian general by the name of Naaman. And it is a, a wonderful story of understanding again that God's grace moves in and among us, and we should really be aware and alert, not by our standards, but by God's standards. So if you have nothing else to do, you might want to get on your concordance and kind of slide back into the book of Kings and read that marvelous story. But I chose instead to talk about the gospel lesson again. It is found in Luke's gospel. It's kind of lengthy. And it begins in that 10th chapter with the first 11 verses. Then we skip over some words of warning that Jesus gave to people who had good opportunity and passed it. And maybe we should read those as well. And he goes on to conclude with the verses 16 to 20. Let me just read it to you. And there's some things we will deal with in the passage, some things I do not intend to deal with today. So before we read the scripture, let us ask God's blessing upon its reading and its hearing. Will you pray with me? Lord, this is the day that you have made. May we rejoice and be glad in it pray that we would not be so much about physical comfort or things that please us, but Lord, we pray instead we would always be discerning what is right and perfect and acceptable to you. So we're praying our hearts are now properly attuned, that we would set aside other activities and other thoughts and give ourselves to the hearing of your word and that it might find us anxious recipients of its transforming power. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs in every town and place where Jesus himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone there is, who is, let me read that again. And if there is anyone there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. For the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, 
Even the dust of your, your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet, know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. There are some things in that text that are a little hard for us to get hold of. I don't recommend handling scorpions or treading on snakes as a routine, but that's part of the record, and I, I know there are some interesting exegetical uh, commentaries on these matters. This sense that Jesus sent his disciples out saying, I want you to know before you go, it's not always going to be easy. Don't take a lot of stuff with you. Don't get caught up in ancillary conversations along the way. Your mission, your task is to share with them the kingdom of God. Even though the pirates are playing really well, you know, stick to the focus of your mission, why you're going out. Pray for those who are sick that God will grant them healing. And if there's a place that accepts you, they're actually accepting me. And if there's a place that is uninterested in this mission of yours, you have my permission to turn away from them saying, you have been warned. The kingdom of God was pretty close. It's really not as ominous, I think, as the scripture makes it sound. So these 70 in pairs, two by two, went out into the highways and the byways, all the places that Jesus himself would be going, and they began to share. And when they did, they were amazed at the reception they got. They came back saying to Jesus, even the demons were afraid in our presence. And Jesus said, I saw the whole thing. It was like a lightning show. And he said, as good as that is, don't get caught up in that. What you need to be most thankful for is that you now belong to this kingdom of God. It was in 1961. It was on January the 20th. It was Inauguration Day. The youngest president of the United States the first Roman Catholic faith president of the United States, rose there in Washington, D.C. to speak to the country and to the world in his inaugural address. And, and I was a fairly young man at the time, but I know even then it created quite a stir. Some of you remember it as well. It was a good speech. It's available. You can look it up and read it. It's not very long. And and it captures some of the best ideals of what it means to be a citizen of this great country and also our responsibilities to one another and to the world. But it ended with a couple of paragraphs that I want to read to you. It was John Fitzgerald Kennedy. It was JFK at his finest. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, I can't quite do JFK. Ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward with history, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth God's work must truly be our own. Wow. Right. Glory. At a time, it's the time 
that my life has been lived and it preceded me by a little, there was a shift in the role of government. Now, if you are into political stuff, you know this. But up until the 1930s, we had been a country of small government. And then we had what we called the Great Depression. And the politicians of that time saw some ways in which they might expand government to care for the citizens of this country and thereby maybe get the country back to work and the New Deal and, and the Great Society and some other phrases that you may have heard and some of you would remember began to change the landscape of our world. I've written it this way, at a time when the role of government was expanding and expanding and entitlement was a wave crashing against the shores of our independent spirit. How about that? JFK hit a nerve with his citizens of America and perhaps citizens of the world in his inaugural address. His eloquent rhetoric and persuasive delivery ask us all to realize this central truth. It's not about us. It's not about entitlement. It is about the mission. You know, the Latin word for mission is sent. When we talk about the mission, it means that we're sent. That we are responsible for something that is bigger than ourselves. It's not about what God can do for us. Ask not what God can do for you. But that's kind of the, the theme of contemporary conservative Christianity. There are people who like to proclaim that when you come to faith, you're going to get everything you want. And that plays well in a culture that is interested in entitlement. But it is not what I find as I read the gospel to be the main thrust. But I hear in the gospel, you'll have what you need. But beyond that, you will be a part of the kingdom of God's purpose. Verse 11 in the text we read today, Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. We mentioned earlier in the announcements today that our culture, at least the Christian, conservative, Methodist, United Methodist type of Christianity, has lost something over the years, and that is to make sure that what we worship on Sunday in church together is something we continue in the home. Therefore, a summer like no other, saying, let's try that again. Let's read God's Word together. Let's pray together. Let's consider what it means to have that continuation of the faith act of Sunday Follow us throughout the week. Our mission statement here at Community United Methodist Church is something we hear occasionally, but once in a while we need to raise it up and take a careful look at it. You probably know it, and you can say it with me. Our mission statement is to know Christ and to share Christ with others. There are lots of good mission statements out there, but I don't know that there are any any better than that that our first responsibility is to be a part of the kingdom of God individually, that our lives belong to God, that we have made that confession that we are sinners in need of God's grace, and through Christ we belong to God. Our sins are forgiven, and we stand among those who are, redeem, uh, those who are redeemed. And we don't know what this life will bring to us, but we know when this life's journey is over, by the promise of Christ himself, we'll be with Christ forever. That's good news. That should make us smile regardless of the circumstance. It's knowing how the end turns out even before the end comes. But part of that mission statement is not just to know Christ so that I have that assurance in my life. It is to share Christ with others. And I think that's something that we need to think about often because it's something that eludes us. It gets away from us. And somehow we assume, since we know it, other people know it as well. Dr. James Forbes, who is a gifted African-American preacher, uh, for a long time he preached at uh, New York City Riverside Church. Many years ago, when I was a fairly young pastor, he came to Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And once a year in those days, we had a big men's gathering, and Dr. Forbes came, and he preached 
at that, uh, the Masonic Temple there. Never knew if that was a conflict of interest, but anyway, we were there at uh, the Masonic Temple, and the proclamation that day was really good. It was really bad theology. You know, I'd just come out of seminary. I knew good theology from bad theology, at least as I was trained, and I thought, if he can do it, I can do it. Because sometimes what's obvious in the Scripture can be also set aside to see the setting in which that took place. That was the bad theology part. He talked about the prodigal son, or as he liked to say, the parable of the lost. It was the lost older brother and the lost younger brother. You know that story very well, and you know that the day comes when this young man said, Father, I want my share of the inheritance. He took it, he cashed it in, he headed off to the casinos in West Virginia. But he found out the wheel didn't turn his way and the dice didn't always come up to his advantage. And soon he had literally run through all the money that he had. And then all those friends that he had had kind of dissipated. And since he had nothing to offer them, he found himself alone in a strange land. And at that time, he was looking for some way to survive. And a good Jewish boy would have nothing to do with pigs, but the only job on the help wanted list was feeding pigs. And after living out there in the pigsty for a while, the young man says, my, my father's servants have it better than this. They have clean quarters in which to live, and they have three squares. I know I've made a horrible mistake, but I'm going to go back home, and I'm going to say to my dad, I'm sorry. I hope you'll take me in. That's a great story. But what we read in Luke's gospel there in the 15th chapter, the old man standing at the gate every day looking down the road where his son left, and he's anxious to see him come back. And one day, sure enough, he recognizes this form on the road. And he races out to meet him. James Forbes is a great orator. He made this story come alive. Since that's not the main focus of my preaching today, I simply want to tell you that he finally brought us to the moment when the son and the father met and that little exchange they had. And then Dr. Forbes asked us, he said, there's some people in this parable that we don't think of very often. He said, who do you see in the story? Well, the father, we see him. We see the son who went away. We certainly see him. We see the older brother who was upset and angry. And then he said, but who else? And we were kind of all stymied. He said, what about those servants that were standing near to the father? And when the father said, go and get a robe, the best one, and bring it, somebody went. And when he said, go and get a ring and bring it and put it on his finger, somebody went and did so. And he said, when somebody go and get a ring and get a food and get, get the fatted calf and get the shoes for his feet, he said, we don't know who those people were. But what we do know is that they did the father's bidding. They're unknown, they're unnamed, but they're a part of the story. So his story that day was, we need to be those people. We need to be those who stand close enough to the Father that when there's a mission to be done, he simply needs nod in our direction and we set off to fulfill his command. That was a long time ago I heard that sermon and I've not forgotten it to this very day. The reason I want to share that with you is that it's not about us. And that's counterculture today to say so. It's not about us, it's about our place in the story. It's about our willingness to be that servant who goes and does as we've been asked to do. In the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we find what we call the Great Commission. Many of you know that without even looking there. You've studied it, you've thought about it, you've heard it preached about. It is found there in the end, the last chapter, and when the risen Lord turns to his disciples and said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. That's our mission. But it's easy to get, and if you, if you want a second opinion about this, you know, we're, that's a, it's a good thing, I think, often to have a second opinion. Stay for the, the current service that Frank Aldea, Frank Wave, uh, Frank, our youth director, is preaching at Current this weekend, and he preached a fine sermon last night on this very thing, that it is not about us. I would like to 
share again an observation by one of my favorite preachers, Bishop Will Williman. And Will talks about this 28th chapter of Matthew, and he said, The risen Christ gathers his disciples one last time for one last word before he ascends to the Father, and he asks this question. Does he tell them, I want you to get some real estate, get a good mortgage, build a large building, and put my name on it? Or does he say, I want you to settle right here. This is a beautiful spot for a retreat. Just relax and rest. You've been through a lot of traumatic experiences. Just breathe deeply and contemplate the notable teachings that I've laid on you. No, what he says is, go, get out of here. I am sending you out into the whole world. Baptize everyone you see in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be with you till the end of the age. Just make to be sure that you go where you're supposed to go. The point, I guess, today for this Communion Sunday is for us to think again about the fact that from the earliest days, Jesus came teaching about the kingdom of God, but all the time he was teaching, he was also preparing those nearest to him to say, the day will come when it's your job to go. When you're the servants who will go and get the robe, and you will go and bring the ring and the shoes and the fatted calf, that you are the servants of the mission. It's not about you. You shouldn't ask, God, what can you do for me? And a great deal of our faith is tied up in God, help me. Do for me what I want done. The truth of the matter is, that's not the, the predisposition of the gospel at all. The gospel is entirely aimed outward, not inward. That we are to go into the world and we are to bind up the broken. We are to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We are to be the very hope and the presence of God in the larger world. And somehow we've learned to live as anonymous Christians. We learn to live saying to people around us, oh yeah, I go to community church. When asked. Instead of being the one who looks for opportunities to enter into people's life and their struggle with a word of hope and assurance that we have found here in our faith in Christ. It's a dangerous game. You may not always be well received. In fact, you may be rejected. And if you want to hear about that, read next week when Frank preaches at Current about the stoning of Stephen. Being the bearer of God's good news can be risky business. I've talked to you about this before, but let me just say it in closing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer came from a good Christian family in Germany, and he was educated in the finest universities in Germany, in the University of Berlin. Back in the 1930s, when the world began to be a little mad in Central Europe, and with the rise of fascism and Nazism under Adolf Hitler, Bonhoeffer became, began to be aware that he was unwelcome in his own country because the things he held dear were not the way the culture was going. And because he was such a gifted scholar, he was invited to New York's Union Theological Seminary, and he was very well received when he came here to the United States far from Hitler's Germany. And he was offered a permanent professorship at Union Theological Seminary, and it was attractive and it was safe. And Bonhoeffer could have stayed and continues his academic life here in America, and he would have been a great asset, and he would have been a strong witness. He prayed about it. Part of him thought he should go back to Germany and insist the church in its struggle there, but what could he do? He was only one person. He could certainly do more good by staying here in the safety of the hallowed halls of Union Seminary, preaching and teaching. He prayed about it often enough that finally he read in Paul's letters something that Paul said to his younger co-worker, Timothy, come before winter. Now that's a phrase I had to look up. It didn't even ring in my bell, but, but it is a phrase that Paul just threw in and somehow that found a place in Bonhoeffer's psyche and his soul. There on that evening, Bonhoeffer said he finally knew what he had to do. And he said a great sense of peace settled over him, a peace from coming that comes from doing what you know God wants you to do. Ask not what the kingdom can do for you. Ask what God's asking. Instead, Bonhoeffer went home. He was on a ship returning to Germany, and then when he returned to Germany to almost certain death, he didn't know whether he could do anything to stem the tide of Hitler's Nazi Germany. But he went because he felt it was his mission. 
we know the rest of the story, and we know that finally he did come under the auspices of them who were persecuting, and he himself imprisoned. He wrote beautifully letters and papers from prison and other items before, right at the very end of the war, he was himself hanged. We have fallen into a culture that tells us it is about us, and it's what's best for us, and it's what suits us, and it's what pleases us. And then we read today in Luke's Gospel, Jesus began to train those disciples, and he sent 70 of them two by two. He said, travel light. Don't get bogged down in all these other things. Don't even take time on the road to discuss the winning record of the pirates. Get to the heart of it. Go to places that need to know God is real. God's love is real. God calls us to a higher level of life. God invites us into the very kingdom of God. Stay with those folks there. Don't, uh, don't make it about you. Don't move from house to house. Eat the indigenous food, whatever that may be. And just because the next door neighbor now has heard you preach, says, why don't you come stay with me? And it's a nice house. Stay in that first humble place where you, because it's not about us. It is about the mission. It's a challenge for us then today to go back to that January day in 1961 when a very young JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you. It's a great speech. It's a great thing about American culture. But I raise it another notch today, not on my own merit, but on the merit of the word of God. Ask not what God's kingdom can do for you. What is God asking you to do? What is your mission in this place? Where are the places where you are to be the one who lifts up the cause of Christ and become a witness and a proclamation? Some places it will be well received. Other places it will be rejected. It remains our mission. Today, I hope you'll think about that as we come now to communion. Remember that we've been invited not that we might have everything we want, that we, we might ask the question, Lord, what would you want? And when we ask that question, God will answer. And he'll lead us to some places we never intended to go. But it is where the mission of the faithful, the called, will find its place engaged in the world. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the word Christ gives us. Today, we thank you for the sacrament that reminds us that we belong to you through what Christ has done. Teach us again, as we learned in Christ, that it's not about him. It's about his purpose in your redeeming presence. So we thank you for the word. We pray now that our hearts will be stirred to think about how we might better live as witnesses for Christ. And Lord, we pray that we would remember today, it is not because we are righteous. It is because through faith in Christ we are redeemed. In his name we pray. Amen.